This is a period of intense geopolitical uncertainty. In fact, one of the points the Prime Minister made in his address while the manifesto of the Bharati Janata Party was released, that you need a strong and decisive government at a time when there is so much uncertainty globally. To get a sense of what to expect, especially from a foreign policy prism over the next five years, when it comes to India's position in the world, we are joined on India Today, live and exclusive at this time by India's External Affairs Minister, Dr. Jay Shankar. Dr. Jay Shankar, thank you very much for taking our time and joining us on India Today. Welcome. Do you hear me, sir? Okay, just, yeah, absolutely. Okay, welcome, Dr. Jay Shankar. I want to spend some time trying to get you to explain to all those watching at this time what to expect from India internally and externally, particularly from India's place on the global high table over the next five years if the Modi government gets another chance to come to office on the 4th of June. Minister, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Rahul, good to be back with India today. Uh, and I think it's a very important day. I would like to convey my Happy New Year wishes to many people in different parts of India. Uh, but it's also a day when uh, we have released the manifesto uh, for the BJP. Uh, and it's an important document because it sums up what we have done in the last 10 years. It lays out the short-term goals for Modi 3.0. But it also lays out a larger plan for the next 25 years, a roadmap, I would say, for the next 25 years. Now, in terms of what we have done, I think people have seen, people have seen us from becoming a fragile five to a top five economy. Uh, they have seen an enormous social uh, support network through various yojanas, housing, food, ration, health come up. They saw how we battled the COVID, the leadership that the government gave, the solutions we found. And also they are seeing today that Atma Nirbhar Bharat in different domains is actually yielding uh, dividends, that manufacturing is coming back uh, into this country and also that the farmer is getting a fair deal. So if one looks at the key constituencies, which is really the poor people, the youth, the farmer, the woman of our country, Nari Shakti, uh, I think uh, all of them in some way or the other actually have benefited enormously in the last 10 years. Now going forward, which is really your question, uh, we, are, we have a range of today, you know, uh, it's a long document, there are very specific promises. I think the prominent ones uh, would be definitely for citizens over 70, we have promised free health care through Ayushman Bharat. Uh, for uh, people taking mudra loans, we have committed that we'll increase it from 10 to 20 lakhs. We are going to increase startup funding. Uh, we are looking to see uh, how we can actually uh, enhance manufacturing in this country, make it really into a capability technology engineering hub. Uh, for the farmers, we will uh, encourage them to become self-sufficient in pulses and edible oil, which you know is in very high demand. Uh, for workers, uh, we would uh, actually through eShram uh, find ways by which they are more aware and aware of their benefits. Uh, uh, generally for the public, I think how to improve, uh, expand Jan Oshadi Kendras, how to improve infrastructure. You know, it could be from Mande Bharat trains to more bullet trains uh, to increasing the current pace of railway building, which is 14 kilometers a day, and road building, which is 28 kilometers a day. So. Uh, pretty much, I would say, every section has something in it. We are looking forward for uh, India, Bharat to emerge as a hub, as a hub for manufacturing, as a hub for technology, for aviation, for defense, for space, for electronics, for semiconductors and chips. And these are not just promises. These are, these are goals resolutions which are made, targets which are made on the basis of 10 years of performance. Minister Jayshankar, I want to spend some time focusing on certain aspects of foreign policy. 
uh, which are also linked to domestic politics. And I'll start with Kachaiti, for okay. example. Uh, you would have seen your predecessors as foreign secretaries, the likes of Ashif Shankar Menon, Nirupama Rao and some others coming out and saying that taking up because of domestic political reasons, wanting to reopen an international agreement with a neighbor is fraught with danger, could set a wrong precedent. Can you explain to those watching at this time why you think the Kachaiti agreement with Sri Lanka needs to be relooked and what specifically do you intend to do, Minister, if your government does get an opportunity to come back to power? I, th I think, Rahul, it cannot be anybody's case, however experienced you may be as a diplomat, that when a political par party takes one position inside the room, and a radically different position in public forums, including parliament, that this kind of double speak should remain concealed from the Indian public. When we have an election, the public is entitled to know the truth about the party for whom they may be voting or not voting. So let's not use diplomacy as a cover to cover up political falsehood and hypocrisy. You know, when a party in Tamil Nadu says, we had nothing to do with this set of agreements, that it is the center which is doing it and disregarding it. And by the way, this is not history. This is being said even, I mean, in the last few years. The chief minister has written to me 21 times on this matter. So what am I supposed to do? Let him get away with his falsehoods? That's, I mean, please do not use diplomacy as a cover to, to actually obscure the, the record of the parties today. Because... We have had a long history of doublespeak in this country. The BJP is a party, at least what you see is what you get. When we say something, we do something. You see that in the manifesto. And I think it's time people of Tamil Nadu know the truth. If today there is a problem, how we deal with the problem is a different issue. Uh, because you know the matter is also sub -judice. But don't say, don't talk about it because, oh, by the way, it's embarrassing somewhere else. It's not embarrassing out there. Let's be honest. It's embarrassing to DMK, it's embarrassing to Congress party. You know, it's good to see you make a whole-hearted political pitch, but that's on the domestic politics. The question is, you're also external affairs minister. What specifically do you intend to do? Because you could well be in Colombo meeting, your counterparts meeting, other leaders there. Are we asking for Kachaiti Island to be returned to India? What specifically are you pressing for, apart from exposing domestic hypocrisy of our regional parties? Uh, Rahul, right now we are going into elections. There is, you can say, the public, you know, what does the public do in an election? It audits a political party. It looks at, you know, where has the party delivered and where has the party cheated? I think this audit this time will bring out that for years, decades, the DMK has actually been cheating on the issue of Kachatevu and on the issue of fishing, of our fishermen's rights. So, you know, what we do later, you don't worry about it. I know what to do later. Right now, let's get the truth out. Don't be party to obscuring the truth in the name of diplomacy. Okay, interesting. You've said what you had to, you've dodged the rest, which is fine. That's totally understandable. I want to now come, Minister, to the Guardian report that came out, again linked to Indian domestic politics, which claims that since 2020, uh, India's external affairs agency may have had a role in up to 20 assassinations on Pakistani soil. Uh, how do you look at this uh, report in an international newspaper and the domestic politics in India and what's playing out in Pakistan? And what do you have to say about the veracity of the report? Now, look, how is this a domestic story? First of all, you have something happening in Pakistan, okay? to people clearly of a somewhat disreputable nature, to put it mildly, which is brought out by some paper in UK. Uh, so, uh, I mean, these stories come out. These are intelligence-based stories. You know, no government anywhere in the world uh, confirms or denies intelligence-based stories. But if something did happen to, uh, you know, such people, we need to actually, you're, you know, we are actually debating the wrong issue. Who are these people? Why are they there? What made them famous? What is the service that they've rendered to Pakistan? Why is the Guardian so concerned about their welfare? And why are you so concerned about what the Guardian is saying? If something happened to them, it's bad karma. 
It's interesting you aren't denying the report. You're saying I neither wish to choose to agree or deny because your colleague in India's defense minister, uh, Rajnath Singh, when he was asked this question, in fact, said, Ghar mein ghuske maayeng, what, wanting virtuality to take credit. Assuming that the story is true, wanting to take credit for what the government has done on Pakistani mm. soil, Ghar mein ghuske maara. No, look, uh, I, I saw that interview of uh, uh, Raksha Mantri ji. I think he was stating a general policy. The general policy is that if there is cross-border terrorism, unlike the previous government, unlike the time when we all stood angry and helpless after 26-11 happened in Mumbai, we have been very clear that if this country is attacked by terrorists, we will strike back. I mean, that's been a public policy. So. I, I think he was reiterating that. Uh, intervening Saturday night, Sunday morning, uh, Iran fired 300 projectiles on Israel, including drones and missiles. As India's external affairs minister, how are you looking at this escalation of tensions in the Middle East, minister? You know, uh, look, it's obviously a matter of uh, deep concern. Uh, because uh, it represents an escalation in the situation uh, and uh, that is something uh, which obviously uh, is, is worries all of us because everybody, the entire world has stakes in that region. We have particular stakes uh, uh, in the region. Uh, the spokesperson today has issued a statement uh, on that. Uh, but we would certainly uh, hope, you know, because we are also seeing some more reports coming out of some events today in Lebanon which are taking place right now. So I, I think we have for some time now uh, been uh, concerned about, uh, uh, you know, the conflict uh, uh, which uh, started with the October 7 terrorist attack on Israel, uh, escalating into other dimensions and uh, uh, other zones. So it is a deeply worrying development. But therefore, I think, uh, look, we have today in the world uh, a spreading conflict in the Middle East, in West Asia. We have, again, a very uh, uh, impactful conflict going on in Ukraine, whose repercussions are on beyond. We have a lot of tension in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so I think it's important today that the country has a strong government. It, you know, uh, there is a strong leader with a strong majority who can actually navigate India through what are clearly very stormy uh, weather uh, which we can see ahead. One of the things the Prime Minister said is the guarantee of the Modi government to try and rescue Indians in distress anywhere in the world if they end up getting caught in an unfortunate international situation. At this moment, as our external affairs minister, what's your advice to Indians in this region, whether it's in Iran or Israel or anywhere in the vicinity of the uh, Middle East? And also we're being told that flights to the region are being looked at and you want to pause flights. Are you really concerned that uh, an Indian civilian airliner may potentially come in the midst of uh, these growing hostilities? And where do you see this go from here, sir? Look, uh, where Indians abroad are concerned, I think uh, Modi ki guarantee has been in evidence for 10 years now. Uh, so people know that we are there for them in difficulties. Okay, and it's that confidence with which they set out. Right now, we have advised people not to travel to Israel, not to travel to Iran. We've asked those who are already there to take the utmost precaution not to you know, move about uh, unnecessarily. That's the sensible thing to do right now. Now, we will watch uh, you know, uh, what happens further, and if we have to issue more advisories, if we have to take steps, we will do that. I mean, we have always done it. We did it in Sudan. We did it in Israel uh, after October 7. Uh, we have done it wherever there's a conflict, wherever there's a natural disaster. This is the Modi government. We are ready. We are prepared. We are working on it. We are a 24-7 government. So the next five years, the Prime Minister has promised to make India the world's third largest economy. That's just as far as economic prowess is concerned. As external affairs minister and a thinker on strategy, how do you see this play out in the realm of comprehensive national power, where economics and economy is one part of it, but there's also your standing on the global high table, your military power, your hard power. 
so where do you see the trajectory go over the next five years when it comes to India's comprehensive national power in the global community? Minister. Right. Uh, well, thank you, Rahul. That's the last question I'm taking because I got to move on from here. Sure. Uh, so on this one, I would say, uh, again, what the manifesto lays out. You know, one part is growth, uh, which is uh, we are looking at uh, definitely becoming the top three economies, but we are looking growth with employment so that the benefits of it are shared widely in the country. But we want to build deep national strengths and we want to harness the talent and skills of our people, of our youth for this. So if you look at the manifesto, it speaks specifically about becoming a semiconductor and chip hub. It speaks about becoming an auto and electric vehicles hub. It speaks about becoming a defense hub, a manufacturing hub, a space hub. So these are all you know, achievable targets. You need a government like Modi Sarkar, which can think long term, but which term after term can actually deliver this on the ground. I think the last 10 years have been a very solid foundation. Uh, in the next coming years, we will definitely, I think, be moving in this direction. Uh, and certainly, you know, unlike the past, where we had actually given up on manufacturing, you have people in the Congress party who say we cannot, we are incapable of manufacturing. So we believe we can manufacture. We are the government which delivered 5G. We are the government which delivered co-vaccine. We are the government which put Chandrayaan up there on the other side of the moon. So we trust the talent of India. We have faith in the skills of India. This is a manifesto for young people. It is a manifesto for optimistic India, for a can-do India. And I think that's what people will be voting for all the way up to June 1. Okay, we leave it over there. So thank, thank you very Jay much. Shankar, thank you very much for joining you. us. Thank uh, you. And